Hello, and welcome to another episode of Twack Analyzes the Witness. Uh, before I go into the main section I want to cover today, I want to talk about this tree. So, you know, I've been going back and forth with the lake, kind of showing how the different parts of the lake correspond to different parts of the world. And this tree always catches my eye. Because, so this, this sort of dead tree right here, um... It, it's not the only instance of it in the game. Actually, uh, back in the town near the reflection panel and the sort of coastline there, there's another instance of it. But it's different from the other dead trees around the lake. Like the ones in the sort of shady shadow area over there, they have these branches that are really thin and they kind of curve upward. Whereas this one has these more thick branches that almost curve downward. Um, and so it feels like it's deliberate. And I do want to note that I think sort of what it's looking at is... Uh, this section where the waterfall is, is the mountain. So this is the, uh, the bunker laser. That over there is the swamp laser. And so between them is the mountain. And the tree is not in the lake. So I don't think it's directly part of the lake. Instead, it's sort of above and behind the lake. It's also very tall. But, I mean, what else is very high up that's above and behind the mountain? The sun. It almost, the, the way the branches are curved down almost makes it look like an arrow pointing upward at times. Other times it kind of makes me think of a signpost. Which would fit because this is sort of the main crossroads of the, the game. You can reach pretty much every area from here. Uh, if you go that way, you reach the windmill and the, uh, what's it called? The, the, the desert, the intro area, the town's visible from here. Uh, if you keep going that way, you can hit the shadow area and then the quarry. There's the keep. Uh, you know, you can go up the mountain, which takes you to the jungle, and the monastery is that way. and takes you to the bunker. And then, of course, you can go to the swamp. Now, um, I actually had a hard time finding this when I first played. I think it took me... Uh, a boat trip around the island to notice there was something here which um, you can't actually start this area from the boat uh, there is one area that you do but everything else you have to enter from the island itself but in a way sort of the the tree over there on the lake looking like an arrow if you're coming from the area where you start the game it points towards this direction which, I don't know if that's exactly accidental or intentional or not. Probably just incidental. Additionally, if you were to walk towards the mountain, you would see sort of the landscape ahead of you here. Which is another good usage of sight lines that this game does for navigation. That if you were to walk towards the mountain from the lake, you would probably at least see... Like the sort of building in the middle. Alright. So. Swamp time. Oh, that's kind of cool, actually. If you were to go towards the back entrance of the swamp, you can almost have the statue hold the sun. That's fun. Okay. So the swamp introduces... Blocks. Again, so just take the the sort of teaching puzzles there's only three possible directions well i guess four if you count making an s but you know there's very few unique solutions on the first one and then there's more unique solutions here but only some of them work and then it introduces that there can be different shapes in one space. Uh, this one came to me very quickly because it's like Tetris puzzles. 
personally, uh, these seem to be some of the more complex puzzles in the game as far as, like, pure logic symbols on a panel goes. But I think it being uh, a familiar idea of, like, fitting blocks into a grid helps with that. Um, this one is interesting because while these two don't have the extra spaces on the X, uh, like, they don't have extra columns, this one does, and so this sort of makes sure you understand that the shape has to be aligned correctly. And then there's a few ways you could possibly make this square, uh, but only one of them is possible to actually complete the puzzle with because of the breaks in the lines. I like that these breaks in the lines are used pretty often as like a way to make a puzzle that only has one solution without adding a lot of symbols. It sort of keeps them clean looking, but it doesn't actually, like it, it removes clutter, but it doesn't allow for so many different things. And then finally there's this puzzle that, again, just further makes sure you understand how uh, the blocks work. So by now, like, that should be kind of obvious. You're making the shapes. This one's kind of hard to see. So then here, the first one you're forced to make two separate, uh, sections for these blocks. But here you can't. So... It forces you to just do that, because if you just go up and around and make three, it doesn't work. Um, in this case, it is forcing you to do something that might not seem right at first, but then when it turns out correct, you have to ask yourself what happened. And then here, it uses the symbols that are diagonal to each other, because it's impossible to actually section them off so that the dot and the L are... Uh, in separate areas and so this starts to introduce that idea of combining shapes now i really like this part because whoops i didn't actually complete the puzzle because these all kind of there's three of these puzzles in a row and you pretty much have to do them the same way think I'm actually not I don't think this one can be solved differently um yeah so in this case like the position of the symbols doesn't exactly matter as long as you're able to combine them all into one final shape which is kind of clever in my opinion uh they all have the same solution but with just the different symbol moving around I think you know, three is a pretty common number for a repetition. Uh, comedy rule of threes, rule of three pieces of evidence. In this case, there's three examples of a puzzle with the same solution and same symbols, just with the symbols kind of rearranged. Just sort of enforcing the idea that the position of the symbols doesn't actually matter. Um, like, you don't have to, in this one, put the two to the left of the box because that's impossible. And then finally, there's that one. And then this one, it looks the same as those first ones, but the box and the two shape are too far apart. So that's pretty straightforward. Just uh, a lot of introductory panels. This, uh, this one also starts to introduce this idea of uh, connecting distant shapes together, which is then... Uh, sort of utilized with the moving platform here. This is also another example of a puzzle that functions as a puzzle, but also functions with the world. Uh, whenever these are used, they use symbols that are very clearly sort of, um... Like, th uh, they're, they're symbols that look like the part of the world around them. 
Uh, there's a lot more of these towards, like, the quarry area. That place almost focuses on uh, using machines and using panels to control machines. I know, the, the environmental puzzle sound is kind of loud. Actually, I think I messed it up. Oh, yeah, I did. But you can see the, the bridge is three yellow blocks, and then either side is three yellow blocks. To make it as clear as possible that these yellow blocks are controlling the bridge. Uh, also, if you were to start by connecting this one to this one, then the bridge wouldn't move. So the only other solution, which is to mirror it, that actually solves the puzzle correctly, causes the bridge to move. So, like, it's pretty, uh, oh shoot, I could have gotten it. It's right there. I was just standing in the wrong spot. Um, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it makes it pretty obvious what the panel is doing, even if you just treated it like a panel and not a control mechanism. Also, yeah, so a thing I've seen a lot of people complain about is how slow the moving platforms move in this game. It's hard to make a case for it to people that don't know about the environmental puzzles, or even if they do, they might not... It might be too spoilery to suggest that, like, there is an environmental puzzle there. Um, but in this case, the bridge moves slowly, but the, like, the, the part of it is because there are environmental puzzles that go along the bridge, uh, like I was trying to do, that would be at least very difficult if uh, the bridge moved any faster. Like, you might need that timing to uh, actually get into position or reposition yourself if you're like me and stood in the middle. Additionally, I mean, the game looks really nice. There's a lot of details around the world that you would probably miss if you didn't care about uh, looking around or whatever. It's sort of a stop to smell the roses. Like here, uh, these two trees outline the center area when you're on the bridge. So you see the laser, you see this red sort of shack in the middle, which is eventually where the end of the uh, the area is. So you get this really nice preview of the area, but and it, that also kind of helps with navigation. But yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword in that it helps you appreciate things and it helps you do the environmental puzzles but especially the environmental puzzles not everybody will see in their playthrough and they might get a bad impression if they just think it's being slow for no reason personally it's always been hard to say something is in this game for no reason because when so much of it is intentional it feels hard to make a case that something isn't intentionally designed a specific way or that like it's being malicious but that's neither here nor there for now i do want to mention that the stairway to go up is directly in front of the bridge so it's sort of the most immediately accessible area there's like this area is flooded and then to the right there's also that fence but again, going up here, up this stairway, gives you another good vantage point over the area to, again, better see it. The swamp is sort of, in, I think, the most horizontally spread out area. Maybe the tree houses is also pretty spread out. But uh, in this case, having this higher vantage point when you had to enter from down below really just helps sort of guide you also it showcases all the fun colors all right so with the bridge we started doing uh or we started connecting these shapes that are pretty long whoops that doesn't work um and so now we are actually getting into the puzzle series that combines shapes you can see me there, I had tried to do one solution and it didn't work, 
then it repeats the symbols in their placement with just a different line break. Which again is another instance of using those line breaks to um, make a more sort of uh, complicated puzzle. And then this is another one that forces you to connect uh, distant shapes together to make one big shape. Because you can't otherwise make this one. Uh, you can't make a box around a shape without touching the outside. Then this one, I think, is one that you can do separately. As in, you don't have to do all of them at the same time. Um, it's been a while, though, since I've actually tried it. Granted, I did just do my notes for this the other day, so it shouldn't be this hard. Is it? This? Then that. There we go. Yeah. The previous panels in this series uh, they all required you to connect every shape this just breaks it up to make sure you're not getting in a rut if if the game teaches you rules only by its panels it also wants to make sure that you're not misinterpreting those rules and that you're not picturing a rule where there is none so just because up till now well I guess except for the bridge but on the the single panels you haven't had to separate shapes from each other uh, just because like that's been a thing up till now it wants to remind you that just because yeah just because you've been connecting these doesn't mean you always will it's just sort of a uh, you know breaking the pacing up this also this whole area is made of a lot of these smaller series of puzzles and uh it becomes easy to notice now that whenever there are puzzle series, the final one tends to be the one that is like the most uh, important, I guess. If, if one panel has to leave like a lasting uh, impression on the player about a rule or a symbol or something like that, then, um, you know, you want the last one to be the important one because then they'll linger on it for longer. They'll think about it for longer. All right. This panel is pretty funny. Um, a lot of people get really hung up on this panel because they don't realize uh, that the shape of the this symbol is two-spaced. It's become particularly notorious. Here we go. I even messed it up first uh, on accident, honestly. Yeah, it's become particularly notorious in the community. Uh, there's, I think, a whole subreddit dedicated to posts about this panel, which is kind of rude, but at the same time, I do think it's interesting how this particular one has been uh, the bane of many people. It's kind of hard to tell from a distance, aka the solving distance, that these are two apart. But uh, when solving it as if they were one apart doesn't work, I guess the idea then is you're supposed to understand that they're not one apart. Alright. Rotatable shapes. It introduces this with a shape that is impossible to make horizontally. But it looks more horizontal than vertical like it's almost maybe a 30 degree angle from being horizontal so it's sort of making sure you see like these skewed ones uh well this in this case it goes vertically and then it uses an l sorry that's a j tetromino um but it does it again in a place where you can't make it horizontal but at the same time, uh, it uses a shape that is not, like, having it 
90 degrees vertical and 180 degrees vertical is not the same outline on the panel. And it gives you room to experiment. Well, you could do it either way. So in this case, it sort of doesn't say like you have to turn it left or right. It's just you can turn it. Oops, I accidentally made a mistake. And then we can combine those however we wish. And then this, I think, is... It's not the exact same, but it's similar to the first panel uh, you encounter. Or not the first panel, the end of the first series. The end of the first series has that J Pentomino upright, but you can't do that same solution here. It's uh, it's a sort of callback, this time with a new mechanic. That uh, It's another example of using an older panel, but with a slight difference to iterate on a concept similar to what was in the squares. But in this case, yeah, it iterates on the orientation of the shapes. Also, in the first series, when we do this panel the first time, the corner uh, sort of square is in the middle, where in this case it's the end point that's in the middle. So it trips you up that way as well. It's about not letting the player fall into uh, mindless puzzle solving. Okay, I hope I can do this the way I want to the first time. Um, yeah, you can solve these puzzles in two directions. Right, and the way the platform rotates, I believe, is based off the direction you move around the outside. I could be wrong, but in this case it worked the way I wanted to. This is a good example of using the uh, the wires to navigate, or to let the player move around. Also here, we have a boat. I'll go ahead and call the boat. I won't interact with it yet. But I'll go ahead and summon it for now. Okay. So this final sort of panel series that's above water is more of like a test for the player. Um, hold on, let me just do the, the mental math here. Okay. It's not... Oh, wait. There we go. Uh, it's not like introducing a new idea particularly. It is more about um, just making sure the player knows everything that they need to by giving them some slightly more difficult puzzles. Okay. So I want to do it like that. It's one, two, three, four. There we go. All right. I still need to figure out where I'm working in this T shape. So I'm going to go up, then that, round. Probably not the most optimal solution for that panel. That one's a fun one. I just like it because... You have the uh, the six size square there, the six size shape, and then these two combine to make an eight size shape, but it makes this nice rectangular uh, pattern there. All right, this one gives me a lot of trouble. Um, it's just this uh, specific iteration of it, or this specific sort of panel. Uh, it enforces the idea that you can't make a plus shape. Not enforce. It, it introduces this idea that if you try to connect all the pieces together, you can't actually solve it. Because to make a plus shape on a panel, you would have to loop around back to uh, like the side you started on, essentially. Or you'd have to go towards the corner you started on, which doesn't let you go to the opposite end. 
I mean, you do end up making a plus shape with, like, the windmill, but in this case, you have to force yourself not to connect everything. With that tiny one being left out. Okay, so... The, the sound of the sort of engines moving um, is pretty loud, and it has these little rotatey things here, so that once you solve that final panel... You can see it moving. Uh, also, the wire goes down there. So you can see that, you know, if you're following the wire up till now, that's the next position to go. And then also, I mean, the water's gone. When you're moving back towards this direction, you'll see that this is now accessible. Um, Alright, so underwater section. Actually, first we introduce removable squares. I like this because it uses the a yellow shape that is normally like perfectly fine to do it like this. But then, you know, the question becomes what's the blue square? Does it you can't it's not that it goes between uh yellow squares. It's that it removes one from the total like that. And then again, it removes two this time. This one, it forces you to consider that you have to have the blue square shape inside the final yellow square shape. I like this one because it looks more complex than it is. But when you realize that the entire panel is 16 squares, it becomes sort of quickly uh, understandable. And then, yeah, this one... Uh, builds off that idea that the f the blue square has to be part of the final yellow shape by making a yellow shape where the blue square can't be outside of it. And instead, you have to sort of figure out where you can make a hole in the shape. Okay. So then from there, we didn't actually see where that went, but uh, the dark blue wire goes up and then across. All the way back to where we started with the light blue section. Which is sort of a fun twist on navigating with wires. Now we're navigating with them, but they're above us. Uh, something I think is interesting about this room is that there's a little stain on the ground here. Uh, in front of this tank. Something that I think is interesting is that the swamp is another area where the fact that this game is a video game really becomes apparent. I mean, like, the the swamp has these really vivid colors. And, um, I mean, so, I think the colors are supposed to be natural. Like, there are algae and plankton and things like that that can provide this sort of coloring. Or even just bacteria. Though sometimes it almost looks paint-like on its surface. But then you can also notice that there are these pipes that connect to something. But then they also drain into these tanks. Um, these colors that it uses, the like dark red, the dark blue, the light blue. Uh, those are found in not only like the wires, but also the panels themselves. To the point where it seems like this could be a source of some of the coloring on the island. Uh, but even then, it's still kind of hard to believe that, like, this research station has sort of found these very vivid colors. That it's... I mean, it doesn't seem like it's only using them as, like, manufacturing purposes. After all, they have these huge observation tanks. Oh, also, so this panel here, I mean, it's the bridge panel. If you try to solve the environmental puzzle, it doesn't work. So they give you the panel down here because you need to have the bridge in motion in order to solve the puzzle. If it's all the way on the other side, then it doesn't work either. You have to do it while it's moving. But it is nice that it gives you a way to return if the bridge gets stuck. I think usually if 
the game recognizes that you're in a position in the world where, like, a moving platform needs to connect you to something, but it doesn't. Uh, for example, with, like, that L-shaped bridge that rotates, if you're on one of the sides of it, off the bridge, and then you move it so that it goes away from you, it'll automatically rotate its way back to uh, connect you back up. And so, uh, the game, like, it, it has safety measures to make it so that you don't get stuck. But in this case, I guess it's helpful to have sort of a physical representation of that. Right. <laughs> this one's tricky to me because, I mean, it's the intended sort of trickiness that the first one is on the top... In the second one, you have to make the horizontal shape on the bottom. All right. Not much to say for these until this one. Uh, so this puzzle, the L shape and the J shape, uh, you can't make them both. They can't both fit. And uh, if you try to combine them both, like... I don't even know, like, having the shape here do, like, that. Basically, yeah, you can't combine them all normally, which, obviously, you need the blue shape. But the question then becomes, how do you fit the blue shape in? And this is another one that I think trips a lot of people up, because... This puzzle uh, brings the idea that you don't have to put the yellow shapes in and then remove. It's more like you remove the blue from the yellow and then place them onto the puzzle. Because a lot of people look at it as like, I can't fit the two yellow shapes together already. Where do I take the blue square from? But it's that if you were to fit them together sort of off the puzzle and then remove the blue square, you would be able to do it like this. Uh, it's sort of a twist to what's already been implemented. Uh, everything up till now has been solely based off what's on the panel, but this sort of requires logic that happens off panel and then gets put on the panel. I don't dislike it. I think it's an interesting twist, and it does bring it pretty late into the swamp. So it's not like it is particularly... Um, particularly surprising, I guess. I don't know how to put it. Okay, but so... This is another fun one to me. Just about finding the best place to put that T-Tetromino so that it connects everything else. While still being able to remove some shapes. Okay. Oh, also, I did want to mention that part of the bridge panel being here is, like, it kind of makes you question, why can you control the bridge from here? And then there's this very, very distinct sort of pinkish tube here with a circle. Uh, it's another planted environmental puzzle. I don't know what to call it, but it's one of the ones that are sort of intentionally obvious. Okay, so before we finish off the swamp and get the laser, I am going to go over here. So, if I remember correctly, this puzzle can be done by just doing them separately, and then it is uh, sort of reinterpreted here by forcing you to um, connect the shapes. It's sort of a fun pair of puzzles, because it uses the same shapes and the same placement, just with a slightly different grid. It's actually one column and one row smaller, going from 25 to 16. But uh, it's just a really interesting pair that showcases sort of the relation that the shapes have to the negative space. 
that a, a removal of one column in one row forces a completely different solve completely different solution okay so oh that's interesting that tree has some fun sort of fuzziness to it so uh from here you can get a good view of the tree houses the shipwreck and just sort of nice little tranquil uh bay here of course if you've played the game you might know where we are i mean we're we're near the swamp of course but we're on something particular uh, but there is a audio log here. We have two kinds of knowledge which I call symbolic and intimate. I do not know whether it would be correct to say that reasoning is only applicable to symbolic knowledge. But the more customary forms of reasoning have been developed for symbolic knowledge only. The intimate knowledge will not submit to codification and analysis, or rather... When we attempt to analyze it, the intimacy is lost and replaced by symbolism. For an illustration, let us consider humor. I suppose that humor can be analyzed to some extent and the essential ingredients of the different kinds of wit classified. Suppose that we are offered an alleged joke. We subject it to scientific analysis as we would a chemical salt of doubtful nature and perhaps after careful consideration, we are able to confirm that it really and truly is a joke. Logically, suppose, our next procedure would be to laugh. But it may certainly be predicted that as the result of the scrutiny, we shall have lost all inclination we ever had to laugh at it. It simply does not do to expose the workings of a joke. Classification concerns a symbolic knowledge of humor, which preserves all the characteristics of a joke except its laughableness. The real appreciation must come spontaneously, not introspectively. I think this is a not unfair analogy for our mystical feeling for nature, and I would venture even to apply it to our mystical experience of God. There are some to whom the sense of a divine presence irradiating the soul is one of the most obvious things of experience. In their view, a man without this sense is to be regarded as we regard a man without a sense of humor. The absence is a kind of mental deficiency. We may try to analyze the experience as we analyze humor and construct a theology, or it may be an atheistic philosophy. Let us not forget that the theology is symbolic knowledge, whereas the experience is intimate knowledge. And as laughter cannot be compelled by the scientific exposition of the structure of a joke, so a philosophic discussion of the attributes of God, or an impersonal substitute, is likely to miss the intimate response of the spirit, which is the central point of the religious experience. Arthur Eddington, 1927. Okay, so uh, Eddington already has sort of provided a possible resolution between the tensions of science and like analysis and art. And here Eddington is providing a resolution for the tensions between science and mysticism or spirituality. That uh, Eddington is pr saying that sort of there's two types of understandings the implicit and intimate or sorry symbolic and intimate and symbolic represents the sort of analytical side and intimate is something that can't easily be explained uh, Ed eddington uses the example of a joke which is you know something where if you analyze a joke it loses its humor but eddington's using that which i think most people can agree on is sort of a property of comedy and ex and sort of uh you know going further and saying well if we are giving jokes the past that you don't have to analyze them to feel them then why don't we give spirituality the pass also sort of saying that the analysis of spirituality is counterproductive to the feeling of it which is both 
funny and not funny. It almost seems like uh, Eddington is sort of denouncing the sort of spiritual soul searching that like Kusa has done, for example, that sort of trying to analyze the spiritual feeling is less productive because it loses the essence of what it means to be spiritual. And while to me, Kusa is pretty wordy, he does sort of bring out a sort of sense of yearning for the unknowable that I can, I guess, relate to in a way. Maybe not in a religious sense, but this is just another way that the game contradicts itself. Eddington had contradicted with Burke, or just argued with Burke, argued against Burke, and now Eddington is, in a way, arguing with Kusa and all the other religious philosophy. Uh, also, though, this does sort of relate to the game itself. So, uh, the, the panel puzzles literally use symbols. We literally have a symbolic lexicon of you know, how everything works. The block shapes, the squares, the hexagons. You know, that is literally symbolic knowledge. You could also say that the EPs are symbolic because, I mean, they're symbols, but also uh, we sort of develop a logical process of this looks like a circle. Can it be interpret or can it be uh, turned into an environmental puzzle? When you first see it, though, it's definitely a more spiritual thing. And I think... Or spiritual, I guess, in terms of, like... When you first see the EP, it's just a surprise, a, a shock. Sort of a moment of wonder. And then... Um, like, if you try to look for environmental puzzles literally everywhere, you might get a little sidetracked or distracted or... You might think anything is an environmental puzzle, like, oh, uh, part of these roots looks like a circle, maybe I can, you know, click on it or something like that. Uh, which has happened to me when I first played this game and other people I know and have seen play the game. That sort of everything suddenly looks like an environmental puzzle and by becoming so obsessed with them, in a way, it loses the... Uh, moment of wonder and surprise that the original, the first environmental puzzle you see, brought with it. Uh, let's see. Also, visual Easter eggs are also a sort of implicit knowledge, or sorry, intimate knowledge. Getting my terms jumbled. Uh, it plays off things that we already know, and I mean, if you like, explore. Uh, the, the Easter eggs up close, they don't look like whatever they did. So, like, that's the, the burning man in the tree over there. When we get up close, it doesn't quite look like a man making a fire. But if we view it from the right angle, which we're not viewing it from the right angle here, uh, it doesn't look like that at all. Or, sorry, it, when we view it up close at the right angle, it does look like a, bur a man making a campfire. But it doesn't look like that if we're at just slightly a wrong angle. Um, in this case, we're on the Lady of the Lake Easter egg. You can kind of see her face here. You know, those are the eyes, the smile right there. Um, normally, it's much more visible across the bay over there. Lady of the Bay, I guess? Uh, anyways, I mean, it's a pretty well-known visual Easter egg. That, like, even people who haven't played the game have probably seen in people showing the game. And uh, this Easter egg is not only pretty well known, but it is pretty good. It's pretty related to this audio log. So, um, it's sort of like Mother Earth, which is a common mystical symbol, I guess, is how I would put it. Like, it's sort of a spiritual figure. Uh, but when you're up close and you try to analyze it, it stops looking as much like a spiritual figure or like a deity of sorts and more just like a bunch of rocks on the shore. So from a distance, we can see this and find a sort of joy in seeing a human face and body and like prayer. Uh, but up close, it sort of loses that meaning, which is, I think, more of what Eddington was going for. Also, I want to go ahead and mention something. 
that uh, it's really easy to see here, and when I go to tree houses, it won't be easy to see. But the way tree houses looks from this angle kind of makes it look like a ship. So, like, this tr trunk mainly at the front of it here. So, this is where the bridge extends onto the tree houses. Like, the tree houses proper, I should say. Uh, but. It sort of got this curve like the bow of a ship. Did I say that right? Bow? Uh, and when you think about it, the way the first bridge extends onto the treehouse, like there's not really buildings up until then. There's these wooden walkways and doors, but the first actual houses are across the way. It's sort of like uh, a boarding plank that you would extend from a boat onto land. Uh, I think that's especially interesting when compared with the shipwreck, which you can see in plain as day here. Uh, that, like, this this section of trees here at the start has, like, the rough outline of a boat. Uh, and that's also a boat, but it's wrecked. Also, there's more good sight lines here. You can see the shipwreck, start of tree houses, the burning man, the top of the keep more good ways that it lets you navigate. Alright. So making our way across here, there's a, even yet another visual easter egg. It's a dove. I think there's supposed to be maybe an angle that lets you see it more completely? Uh, I wouldn't be certain myself. But yeah, it's it's a nice little dove. Uh, there's so something kind of interesting about the swamp is there are a lot of boats you can see from the swamp. So I mean, you literally have a dock for the boat, which has an EP here that'll go ahead and do fun little one. But you can see over there, there's the boat that's crashed against the cliff near the end of the game. You can see the tree houses. Uh, which I said was in the shape of a boat, and then you can see the shipwreck. Um, and so, I mean, I know I've been doing a lot of biblical comparison in this series, which is kind of a, uh, sort of a, a trap, almost, in terms of analysis. Like, it's so easy to make biblical comparisons, it's almost not necessary. But there is a dove here. Or at least some sort of bird. I guess I always interpret it to be a dove. But um, something that's kind of interesting to me is how it's very tranquil here. How, like, even though there's these shipwrecks that you can see all around, it's still just kind of calm. The, the shipwrecks aren't, uh, they're not, like, falling into the water. I mean, it's post-accident. But it's, um... Yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty just, like, chill. And it immediately makes you think of, like, the dove in, you know, Genesis or whatever with Noah's Ark bringing peace upon a boat wreck. You know, a boat crashes into a mountain, and that's the end of the storm. Now, I mean, I think that's sort of the reason why the dove is here of all places is if it's intentionally placed, then it certainly sort of... I mean, it does highlight the keep in its outline, which will be relevant when I get over there. But, like, in the place of the game that can see the two most important uh, shipwrecks, there's a dove. And it definitely sort of makes me feel like either it's okay now, or uh, the shipwreck was a good thing and it brought knowledge... You could say that uh, since we entered, or since where you start the game is technically underwater, I believe. Uh, at least it's underground in a weird position that is either next to water or underwater. You could say that we started the game offshore, then came upon shore, and now we're learning. Um, maybe that sort of salvation found at touching a rock is... Uh, 
equal to the salvation that we get from knowledge. Speaking of salvation, this is another pretty well-known visual Easter egg that you can line up these statues so that they're sort of holding hands. It's really nice. But something that's interesting to me, if you were to follow her eyesight for the, the statue here, it looks like it's going towards the wrecked boat over there. So this, I think, is the first... Um, the first sort of instance of me actually talking about it, but uh, The Witness, I believe, I can't find the talk where I heard this, but I believe Jonathan Blow has said that originally The Witness was going to have a more, uh, a more linear storyline, or like a more direct story, not just uh, sort of lore like this game eventually does, but more of like a narrative with plot structure. And if I remember, one of the characters had a parent that died in a boat crash. And the shipwreck symbolism is still present in the game all over the place. You know, like I said, there's the shipwreck, there's that boat. I mean, I just spent a whole lot of time talking about shipwrecks in Noah's Ark. Uh, but it's important to think about, or sort of interesting to think about at the least, uh, how... Everything is um, sort of how those are all part of cut content. Uh, the shipwreck symbolism isn't just about like people landing on a shore where they then live in like a colonial sense. Hold on, I have to think about how I want to solve this. I think I have to do from this side to turn in the direction I want. Um, but more so in the sense that like, shipwrecks are dangerous and people die. Uh, that's why they have that reflective surface in the desert to help ships navigate the cliffside, I believe, the shoreline. At least that was sort of my interpretation of it. And uh, between the shipwreck and the start of tree houses that was over there, it presents sort of both perspectives that, um, you know, it could be a salvation, like a, a sense of people leaving someplace and going to a better one, or it could be danger. And the danger side will have to wait another day. And same with, I guess, the salvation side. But those are ideas I want you to start thinking about for future videos. But yeah, in that case, it almost seems like the lady on that cage was like trying to help whoever was in that boat. Uh, so this is just a fun puzzle. It contains one of every tetromino. I already know the solution, so I'm going to save the time. But this is... I think it's just fun. I mean, sort of... Uh, the, the sort of principle that The Witness and other puzzle games follow is that you play a puzzle game to solve puzzles, and so solving a puzzle is sort of its own reward. I think you see this a lot with other games like Steven Sausage Roll or Snakebird. Um... But in this case, this puzzle doesn't do anything, and it's sort of by itself in this room, but it's a fun exploration of sort of the mechanics of the game. Like, uh, you know, we already have these shapes that can be in all different sizes of blocks. Why don't we just make one with every tetromino? A fun little Tetris puzzle. Uh, I, I personally think it would have been funny if it was uh, possible to make an entire row instead of having the corners cut out at the top. But either way, I think it's just sort of a good showcase of that design principle of like, we should explore the mechanics that we have to their fullest capacity. And if there's an interesting idea that works out well, why not include it anyways, even if it doesn't have a specific purpose? 
Like, it's kind of a difficult puzzle if you haven't solved it before to actually figure out how to line up everything. Um, so I'm not surprised that it's separate from the rest of the game, especially the rest of the swamp, because the other puzzles are much more compact and are more about teaching you the squares and how the blocks work. Um, but so this is just, like I said, it's a good sort of design principle. That's just, if there's a cool idea and it works out, why not include it? Also, I like how this is just another personal thing, but this environmental puzzle here, you have to really angle the camera. It is another interesting use of the engine. In this case, it uses the rendering of like the the object while it's underwater but it explores that okay a poet once said the whole universe is in a glass of wine we will probably never know in what sense he meant that for poets do not like to be understood but it is true that if we look at a glass of wine closely enough we see the entire there are the things of physics, the twisting liquid which evaporates depending on the wind and weather, the reflections in the glass, and our imagination adds the atoms. The glass is a distillation of the Earth's rocks, and in its composition we see the secrets of the universe's age and the evolution of stars. What strange array of chemicals are in the wine? How do they come to be? There are the ferments, the enzymes, the substrates, and the products. There in wine is found the great generalization. All life is fermentation. Nobody can discover the chemistry of wine without discovering, as did Louis Pasteur, the cause of much disease. How vivid is the claret, pressing its existence into the consciousness that watches it. If our small minds and convenience divide this glass of wine, this universe, into parts physics, biology, geology, astronomy, psychology, and so on. Remember that nature does not know it. So let us put it all back together, not forgetting ultimately what it is for. Let it give us one more final pleasure. Drink it and forget it all. Richard Feynman, 1963. All right, so that was a pretty fun audio log. I like the sort of punchline at the end that uh, even though we have all the science to explain the universe and technology and, you know, how things work, uh, if the nature itself or the universe itself wasn't, like, they didn't, it's not entities that intentionally designed these. They don't know physics. You know, the wind doesn't know aerodynamics or uh, the stars don't know astronomy and so in a way it puts us closer to nature by drinking the wine but I think the greater idea or at least a larger idea in terms of the game that Feynman is presenting is that uh, by, by looking at the glass uh, we don't see the entire universe obviously but we see like a lot of processes and physical concepts that are present all over. You know, there's all the subatomic particles that make up the universe. There's the shapes of those. There's like these different processes of pasteurization and disease and aging. And there's, you know, fluid dynamics and physics and there's chemical processes and making the glass and yeah, so there's all these different processes. In a way, it's saying that we can appreciate science in the world by looking at something small because we know that it is, you know, greater than the sum of its parts in the sort of, like, scientific breakthrough sense. Similarly, I mean, we're looking outside uh, this sort of research room through a pane of glass into some funny colored water, which you could say is similar to wine. I mean, 
out here, when you go out, it's purple. Though the side we were looking at is yellow. Granted, I guess it could be white wine. And uh, so, in a way, you know, by looking out into the water here, we sort of have a reflection of the universe. I mean, there's certainly a lot of science going on with whatever they're doing here that researches and collects uh, water with, like, samples in it. Sorry, I have to think again. I guess it doesn't matter which way I rotate if I'm connecting blue and black. Uh, probably... Okay. Probably this way. So... Um, additionally, the Feynman audio log carries on a motif that has been present throughout the game, which is that water reflects the universe. Uh, this isn't exactly uh, one of like the truths or the messages the game is trying to convey, but there's been a lot of talk about reflection. I mean, there was obviously the whole symmetry area that used reflected uh, surfaces and natural stuff to uh, you know solve the puzzles but also sorry getting my notes back in line it fell asleep um, okay also uh, we have like the Kusa audio log about something being visible and invisible we have other easter eggs that are visible in reflections like the lady in the bay we have uh, the the guy reaching for the chalice who is looking through a piece of glass, which we compared to water. And then there's also the lake in the middle of the island. Is It contains the island. It's a map of the island. You know, it has it shows where everything is. But in, in that sense, it contains the entire island inside of it. You know, um, it has every unlockable it has every major uh like landmark well not every major but it has most of the major landmarks and so in that sense the lake is an example of a body of water containing the universe okay so um, this final sort of section of panels, it's another sort of final test, but this time including the subtraction. To do some math here. Oh, right. This is the one where uh, everything can be combined, but you have to figure out first that you have to separate them, and then you have to figure out how you separate them. In that case, the most obvious L shape is not next to the most obvious L shape. Like, those two can't combine with each other and still solve the puzzle. That's sort of the realization you need. Also, alligator. I always thought this one kind of freaked me out. Partially because I have a fear of things deep underwater. Okay, so... Uh, you know, I mentioned how that Tetris puzzle was particularly mechanically difficult. And so it's interesting to me how... Uh, what we have here is a series of final puzzles that aren't particularly difficult in a uh, logical sense. So you would think that... Wait, did I mess up? Oh, I did. No? What am I messing up here? could have sworn this is... A solution. Oh, that's right. They're not in the same one. <laughs> ah, excuse me. Okay. I think I was supposed to do this then. Um, of course, so yeah, I just made a big mistake over this, so that's kind of funny. Uh, but... Oh, right. Okay. So, but what is interesting about these puzzles is that... Uh, it combines a part of the area that we've kind of gone unrecognized, or that has kind of gone unrecognized, 
which is that we've been using the panels to move machinery a lot in this area. So, like, there's been the bridge, and then the other bridge, and then there's other bridges that I didn't interact with. But then also, we've used the panels to open up the water, which has been cleaned out by machines, like by a mechanical method. And so, uh, this just continues that theme of using machines to sort of uh, help you along. It's a fun little maze as well that makes good use of a pretty basic panel by requiring like several different solutions in a row that I of course messed up to actually make it through. Also here's a flower. Haven't seen one of these in a while. Um, in this case it's in the middle of a cage. It's a different color because I mean the cage had to sink down and then come back up and so it's red because it was in the red water. Uh, but it's also, like, it's in a cage, and in a way, we've had to separate the shapes in cages. Uh, it's not quite a one-to-one -one translation, but, like, especially if you look at the single squares that are by themselves, it is a bit more clear what I mean, in that, like, these, these boxes that we have here are similar to just drawing boxes around shapes. I mean, if each yellow square on the bridge is uh, part of the yellow square here and the shapes, then, um, like, surely it could be said that one square is one yellow bridge square. I don't know if I'm being clear or if I'm just going in circles. That's sort of how that flower relates there. I apologize if I've been a little scatterbrained today. My notes are... I'm still figuring out the best way to use those. This is pretty fun because these have pretty much the same shape in that both times you're making sort of this uh, L, pen L tetromino, but here the difference is that you have to include that, so... I mean, you could, I guess, do both of them the exact same. This first one has way more possible solutions. Nope. Oh, right. Of course not. Never mind. It's that you have to exclude this one from the main shape. And then this one, you draw it with the negative space. So, I guess, in a way, it explores the relation between having just the shape by itself and then having the negative version of the shape with a shape that covers the entire panel that this has to include the yellow squares in the uh the final shape you make on the panel but this one cannot include those blue squares all right kind of a nice place up here i really enjoy this sort of mountainside walkway area pretty pretty casual there's also a lot of environmental puzzles around here that i think i can get the purple fuzzy one over here at least one of them i think should be visible yeah i'll use the bridges over here and then of course this little pool right here it's very conspicuously placed just have to find the right angle. Not quite high enough for it. Almost. Not quite. This is... I actually really like this environmental puzzle, but I can never remember how I'm supposed to do it. I just think it's fun because you kind of have to really go up the mountain and keep... I think I need to go even higher than I am, but I'll come back for it later. It's sort of a fun exploration of negative space again. And again, I apologize for being kind of scatterbrained today and talking in loops. This is very pseudo scripted. 
Okay, so for the sort of final point I want to bring up for today, for this video at least, I'm going to go back to the lake. Um, so we saw the shipwreck, so I can go ahead and point out that this rusted piece of metal out here is supposed to be the shipwreck. It has one Dorito puzzle, one audio log, and one bunker. And then there's some other stuff over here by tree houses. But, now you can see that right here, we got the swamp laser. Which I guess I like that this whole section is like kind of muddy, like half shore, half water. Because the swamp itself kind of blends together water and land. But, so now we can see this statue of a woman underwater here. You can kind of make it out from here that she is holding one of these candle boxes that signify the lasers. And there's something really interesting about this. So I mentioned that shipwrecks are a pretty common motif, but so is drowning in a way. Like there's the siren statue that is over by the intro and the monastery, which will come a bit later, has a whole lot of these symbols. But uh, this woman with the, the box, like, I mean, I guess we wouldn't know if she would be safe or healthy were she alive. She is a statue after all. But if we were to sort of take this to be like she's frozen there, then she would have had to have drowned. She kind of looks like the statue of the lady that's on the mountainside. You can see her from there. Hey. But if that's the case, for that statue that's on the mountainside to be underwater, or to even reach the swamp laser, uh, it would have to fall over into the swamp and just kind of destroy everything. So, uh, the other option, or the other sort of like uh, explanation for this is that this represents under the mountain where secret knowledge lies that you can get every laser you know on the on the lake here but the true final laser the true final goal is underground somewhere under all these audio logs but I don't know in a way it sounds like it's warning us like is it really worth going for all these lasers? Because here's an example of somebody who reached for these candles and fell into the water for it. In a way... Oh, that's cool. I didn't even notice this before. That's really fun. So in a way... um, Actually, that furthers my idea that that tree is the sun based on where that audio log is. Okay. But so it furthers that idea that, like, is symbolic knowledge worthwhile? So, like, if what we've been doing is a lot of going around the world and making observations about the world. Now, for the symbols on, like, the panels, we've literally made observations about the symbols and tested them, and that's all fine. But... Is it worthwhile to actually sort of dig into the themes? Because here, uh, this woman holding a candle, you know, it could be that she is holding a candle that represents, like, the true meaning of the game, quote-unquote. It's buried under there, hidden somewhere. At the same time, we did just sort of listen to this Eddington audio log that was saying... You know, uh, is it worth replacing the uh, the sort of intimate knowledge of how you experience the world with symbolic knowledge of rules and laws and theory and stuff like that? And that is a complicated question, one that the witness seems to be asking us. Is it worth it to us to explore art? Is it worth it to us to you know, uh, explore art again is the one that was over there. Is it worth it to us to find rules where there might not be any 
are rules necessary to enjoy something? Is meaning necessary to enjoy something? I don't know. <laughs>